They all left. Departure. Ah, huh. that's what rapture means. Departure. Go. Let's go. Um, for those um, fathers in here, you were given a happy Father's Day number one dad card. Um, and a happy Father's Day. I'm going to read uh, the scriptures that are here. Psalm 127. Um, if you didn't get one, I'll... these were graciously given by uh, a family to all the fathers here. So. Behold, children are inherited from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of warriors, uh, or in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gates. So, um, that's uh, one one of the verses that are uh, passages that are written in your card, guys. First uh, Corinthians sixteen thirteen. There's another one. Obviously, I you know have to do my Bible you know walking here to get to the place, but. Uh, First uh, Corinthians sixteen. Thirteen, and it says, I believe that's Corinthians, it says, uh, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. So, um, need that if you're going to be a father. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. And then Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. Um, so we will be in uh, Philippians, by the way, if you're you know, wondering where you can go. Um, Philippians 6.6. 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates and on your refrigerators and on your washing machines and on your TVs. Oh, no, that's not in there, but probably be a good place to put them also, right? So, uh, places that we visit. So, anyway, thank you for the card. And, uh, those are some scriptures for you guys to... Uh, and I say happy Father's Day, but... Uh, I didn't bring any flowers. Sorry, guys. You know. Um, anyway, we are in Philippians. We're going to start our book today. And uh, a very powerful book. I, I hope this message uh, really resonated with me personally. So, uh, but uh, I don't know how many of you know what June 6th is or what uh, day that commemorates, 1944, is the invasion of Europe, or the reinvasion of Europe. We call it D-Day, the battle, of, beginning of the Battle of Normandy, the beginning of the, you know, kicking Germany out of Europe, Western Europe, and ultimately kicking them right back into their own country, and then, you know, uh, banishing the evil empire, if you would have it. Well, the book of Philippians is another invasion of Europe. I don't know if you know that or not, but that's what it was about. Um, and you can, uh, I'm, I'm going to just tell you the story lest we get lost or I get lost. But in Acts chapter 16, Paul being on his second missionary journey with Silas, Timothy, and Luke, they were going up and they were uh, in Turkey 
Asia on the other side of the, the sea and uh, they kept wanting to go north and the Holy Spirit, you can read this for yourself, the Holy Spirit kept telling them, no, you can't go. And it doesn't tell us how he told them that. Doesn't tell us at all. It just says he forbid them to go and he forbid them to preach the gospel. Many of us would say, that's a strange thing. He forbids me to preach the gospel. And they were wondering what they were supposed to be doing because they wanted to go northeast and then they wanted to go north. And he was hindering and not letting them go forward. Now, there's four guys here. There may have been more, but there was at least four on this missionary journey. And it's probably about 10 years before he wrote Philippians, this book that we are reading. But then he had a, a vision, and I don't know what kind of clothes a Macedonian wears, but he had a, a vision or a dream, and it tells us that, of a Macedonian calling and saying, come over and help us. And uh, like I say, I don't know what the difference, how Paul knew, how they knew as a group. Uh, uh, it was a Macedonian. Maybe there was a certain hairstyle or clothing or whatever, but they understood that they were supposed to go. Macedonia is now northern Greece. Okay? And so uh, they perceived, hey, we're not supposed to go this way, we're supposed to go that way, you know, and many of us would go dong, you know, the lights go on, but uh, it's not always easy to discern, you know, exactly what God's telling you to do, but he does give direction, because it is the Holy Spirit who had the plan here, and so they get the Macedonian call, if you would have it, they cross over and uh, end up in the, the port city, uh, opposite, uh, just down the road from uh, Philippi, but then they end up in Philippi. They meet uh, uh, Lydia there, and Lydia was a seller of purple from Thyatira, and so she is there. They find a place where they're at a prayer meeting down at the river, and they find out she's a God-fearing woman. Paul shares the gospel with her. She gets saved. And then they join up. She joins up with Paul and begins to minister to the four guys. And then, yeah, you know, Paul's just scoping out the territory, if you would have it, walking through the city. And uh, there's this girl that shows up, you know, uh, at the same proximity. And she's a slave girl that has a, it says, spirit of divination in my Bible. Um, in other words, my translation and she is a, a fortune teller or a prophetess from the darkness. And uh, she's following Paul around. Paul doesn't immediately do anything, but after a while, she's basically saying, this man knows the way of God, and many of us would go, well, if they're not against us, they must be for us. No, 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 no. Uh, Satan wants to slip in and join the church and undermine it, and so, Paul finally gets annoyed, it tells us, and he turns and he rebukes the spirit that's within the girl, and it's gone. Well, she's a slave girl. She's owned by a couple other people, and they've been making money off the fact that she's a fortune teller, you know? And so now they're upset. And you got to understand, Philippi is not, uh, they didn't even have a synagogue, so there wasn't 10 Jewish men in the city. There's no synagogue. Okay, it was a Roman city, it was a little Rome, and it was an outpost city where they would retire Roman soldiers, and it was uh, basically modeled not after a Greek city, but after Roman culture, and it was a Roman city, and so they get upset, and so they stir up the whole city. And one of the things that they said, they are doing things and preaching things and telling people things that are against Roman law. And so Paul and Silas, uh, where Timothy and Luke were at the, this point in time, they're not mentioned. Maybe they were doing some other work. But they're taken. And uh, they're taken before the magistrates after they're roughed up. Then they're beaten and they're thrown into a prison. And the next place you find him is in the prison praising the Lord. Now, many of us would go, that is strange. 
you know, they're beaten, they got, you know, they were beaten with a, a cat of nine tails, so they got whips, they got lashes, they're hurting, they're bleeding, they're chains, they're in a dungeon, it is not a comfortable place. And there they are praising the Lord, and then an earthquake comes, and all the doors fly open. And the Philippian jailer, uh, being a Roman, knows that, man, you let a criminal escape, you're dead, you might as well, rather be crucified, might as well just fall on your sword. And that's literally what he's going to do. And Paul says, no, man, don't do it. We're still here. We haven't fled. And the guy falls down and he says, man, what do I need to do to get the God that you have? What do I need to do to get saved? And so Paul shares the gospel with him, him and his whole household get saved. And that was the beginning of the invasion. First of all, the rebuke of what? The satanic forces that bound this girl. And now the invasion begins, the foothold in Europe. That's where it started. And this group of people that were spread, because Paul ends up leaving Philippi, this group of people became the strongest supporters of the work of God through Paul that you can find in the scriptures. There was other churches, there were other good churches, but nothing like Philippi. Paul said, I have you in my bowels. He's going to use that term for most of us. We're like, man, who wants to talk about bowels? That sounds like something from, you know, a commercial, you know, but he's talking about his innermost being, you know, and he had these people on his hearts or on his heart. He, he loved these people and there was a mutual, and we will get into this, the mutual binding together of what we use the term for uh, communion is koinonia. Koinonia is used in this book a lot. Um, well, uh, it is important, that it, its usages. Um, koinonia is to have all things in common. It is a sense of particip participation, partnership, and it is uh, used in so many different manners of communicating verbally, communicating uh, financially, it is used in so many contexts in our Bible, but we, we think because of the way the church operates and because we think of communion, we think of communion as taking, and it is, that is part of that, uh, taking, you know, the, 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 the articles of, uh, you know, the Last Supper, if you would have it, what we call communion and remembrance of the Lord, but there's, the commonness is what Paul has in mind. And this church was, to the record that we know, the only church that supported him financially. And they did it multiple times. But they were participants in more than just finances. So this is not just a shakedown for money. Okay, that's not the point. The point is, these people had Paul in their hearts. They carried a burden for Paul. And that's one of the things that quite often... We, in our society, is you come, you go to a church, you get a sermon, you sing a few songs, you go away, but there's no real participation. There's no real participation. There's no, and I, I love what Seth shared, they all went to Niobara, nobody got drowned, you know, uh, they ate together, they, you know, camped out together. So there's a fire burning there. With that fire comes, you know, getting to know each other. But that is literally, Jesus walked with his disciples. They did what? They did camping every night. It bound them together. It bound them together on a real level. And that's hard to find in America today with our plastic society. Our sense of uh, what? You know, we're isolated. And we even get in that mode that nobody cares. Nobody knows the truth. Yeah, we do. We and and I, I'm not. You know, I know this for a fact. I've been doing this for a while. I've been around people, and uh, you know, we carry burdens. Sometimes we're not supposed to carry. We're supposed to share with other people that they can help us carry the load. There's a sister that came up this morning and asked for prayer. She's under warfare. She's being attacked. 
Ha, huh, I wonder if there's anybody else in this church going through the same things. I know that it is. Because why? Because Satan hates what's going on here and I'm not, I'm not the source of it. The God that I serve is the source of it. The God that you serve is the source of it. And he hates all of us equally. He does. He doesn't want the treasure coming forth. That's the truth. Okay, and that's not just for this church. It's probably in any church. It's preaching the gospel where people are calling on the name of the Lord and God wants to do a work and He is doing a work that we cannot perceive or see. And we wonder why the weirdness. Well, the weirdness is because Satan is doing everything he can to lock us up, to shut us down, and make us feel like we're stupid. That's, that's his number one tool is, you know, you're not worthy. How many of you approach your Christianity from a place of knowledge? You go, well, I don't know enough. That's not, uh, you can always grow and learn, you know. Uh, it is the Spirit of God and what you do know that you can share. And he is so afraid. He's not the afraid because guess what? We are to be invaders. We're not to be victims. And Satan knows that. And so he's trying to do what? Stop us before we get to the beach. Right? He wants us to drown out in the, the sea someplace. Well, he's got a lot of tools that he uses. So anyway, we come back to this place. Paul ends up leaving. He says to magistrates, they're going to let him go free. And he says, no, you tell the magistrates, come in or let us go free. Because, and the reason he did that wasn't just to shame them. It was so that the gospel could go forth. So the Christians would be able to stand and not hide. And he was a Roman citizen. So guess what? They were afraid. Oh my gosh, we beat a Roman citizen without you know, do justice. And so they were afraid. But this church was the first European church. The first. Now you think about human history. Where did Christianity reach in Europe? What part of Christianity did you not get reached in Europe? It went north to Russia. It went what? You know, west all the way to Spain, all the way down North Africa, which is not Europe, but it went to England and, you know, Scandinavia and the whole place. Well, guess what? This was the first city. This jailer and Lydia are the first converts of what would be what? An expansion of the kingdom of God. Now, Paul would go on and plant other churches, Corinth and, uh, you know, Thessalonica in the same area. But the people were to get, what, plugged in, filled up, right, equipped to go out from those places, and they did. And they did. So, um, that's, that's as a, a kind of a beginning. You can go back and read Acts chapter 16 if you want on your own. Uh, now, let's get the picture. Paul, in writing this, is sitting in a prison in Rome. And you can get that from the fact that the Praetorium, Praetorium Guard knows about the gospel. So this is probably about 10 years after he first went to Philippi. We don't know exactly the days, but you know, Philippi was, the church was planted on the second missionary journey. He would have a third missionary journey and then he would go to Rome just as God said. And this is probably his first incarceration in Rome, and the second one he would not get out of. He would uh, die in that place, or physically die, but uh, he would depart to be with the Lord where he is to this very day. So, um, this is a context of his life. He is sitting in chains. He is sitting in another dungeon. Huh? He's not uh, unfamiliar with those things. And most of us, I, I hear Bible teachers, and some of them are really good, but they want to make Paul out to be something that he's not. They want to make Paul out to be Superman. In other words, that he did everything that he did because he was went into the phone book and what? took off his regular clothes and put on his Superman suit. Not so. 
He was human. And we will explore that today. He was as human as you and I are with all the weaknesses and all the stuff that you and I have. And that is important for us. Otherwise, his teaching is for some other super saint. We all might as well go home because we're not super saints. Or maybe you are and I'm not. But that can be the approach so often. It can be. That somehow, you know, God got a real winner when he got Paul, but man, he got me. <laughs> you know, poor God. <laughs> you know, that's not so. He made a choice for you and I. And he knows what he's doing. And your weaknesses are not his problem. Sometimes your perceived strength is his problem. Do you hear that? It's your perceived strength that you're going to chin up and you're going to be strong in the Lord. Yeah, okay. You'll be strong in yourself. And God says, no, if you're weak in yourself, then you can be strong in me. That's the way that it works. Anyways, we'll explore that a little bit more. So let's go to Philippians. We'll run through a few of the verses. And uh, actually, we'll go down to uh, 11. We'll just read the whole text here for today. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of my making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident in this very thing that he who had begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart and as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Christ. This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So he starts with his typical, you know, greeting, uh, using the Jewish greeting and the Greek greeting, grace and peace. Shalom and charis are the two words that he uses. Both of them have context for us in the sense of I can have peace because I've received grace. I received grace when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, as the free gift of God, uh, of salvation. When I surrendered, that's, that's when I, what? That was God's favor. And it is the day of God's favor even today, even though we look out and we see it's becoming much more unfavorable, maybe in certain circumstances. No, God still wants to go out there. He's not ready to pull the plug on judgment yet. He's not. And some of the people that maybe we are most upset with uh, he wants them to be part of his kingdom. A uh, strange concept, I know, but, you know, we were all enemies before we were, what? Before we were friends with God through Jesus Christ. We were all enemies, right? He says, uh, first of all, the first term is bondservant. Bondservant is an Old Testament uh, concept. Bondservant is a slave that was sold into slavery. He's set free and he said, no, I don't want to go free. He said, I like my master. I love my master. I want to stay with my master. I want to serve him the rest of my life. So they would take him with the elders to the door of the house and they would put some sort of a punch up to his ear. They would put his ear up on the door and they would, bam, they poke a hole in it probably put a ring in it so that the hole would be there because ladies you know if you could pierce stairs and you don't put anything in it it'll close up right so and what that meant that the guy was an indentured slave 
because he wanted to be a slave, because he wanted to serve his master, because he loved his master. That is the concept. That is the term that he is actually using right here. He says, I'm a bond slave, a willing slave, not because God said, you will be a slave. He said, no, I want to be a slave. This is the best thing that I can do. And uh, we'll leave it at that. You can run with the Old Testament concept if you want. Uh, go back and read it. But uh, he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, and that's the overseers and the servants. But he says, to all the saints, I, I, I use the Greek term hagios, uh, but probably butchering the pronunciation of it. Didn't look at it. But it means holy ones. It means set apart. Ha! Huh! You guys are a bunch of saints. So we could put those little rings on top of your head, right? No. That's something from another era or something from somebody else's concept. But it's according to God, because you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're set apart. Oh, he's setting you apart. He's working on all that. He's getting you prepared for heaven just as he is me. I'm not quite there yet. But as far as legally, positionally, I'm set apart for him. Right? I'm considered a saint. So are you. Right? Set apart for God. And that's what he writes to them. We already went through grace and peace. But then he says from... God our Father, that is a totally foreign concept, vaguely used by the Jews, certainly not used by any of the Greeks or Romans. You know, the gods of, uh, of the Greeks and the Romans were fickle. They were, you know, they, they were anything but wholesome and right. They, you know, they had headaches. They needed Excedrin 1000. You know, on many occasions, you know, they just, uh, you know, PM and AM, you know, you never knew. And they, they just went based upon circumstance. Circumstances were good, the gods favor me. Circumstances were bad, God doesn't favor me. Well, guess what? The Bible declares that God's always favorable towards me. But he's doing a work. And sometimes that work is contrary to the gods of this age and the gods of this world. And that's where we need to maybe take a mindset of what, what is going to be taught and uh, here as we get into the meat of it. So, God is the author of fatherhood. Did you know that? So, whatever you would consider to be a, 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 a godly father, a good father, that is God. And Jesus was the one that coined that term, wasn't he? Our Father. Right? Our Father who art in heaven. Your Heavenly Father. How many times have you heard that? You're, many of you are going through Matthew uh, at Home Fellowship. Uh, you know, um, and what is it about? I mean, you're going through there. What is Jesus talking about? The, the new relationship that I'm going to have with the Lord through him is what? A father-son, a father-daughter, a family, a familiar, an intimate relationship, a personal relationship, not one where I have to perform, da-da, da-da, you happy now, God? Da-da, you know? No, where he wants me to know him, and he wants to impact my life through knowing him, and through the, what? The work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And uh, I will share this, and I will share this probably multiple times before I go to heaven, unless I go today. But uh, um, sometimes when I feel like I have failed the worst, I mean, when I sit down in my chair or my car and I just weep because I know I'm an unworthy servant and I find more favor in that, that time than I do when I feel like I'm doing really good. I don't get it, I don't understand it because I'm a performance-based person, but that's what happens. And that's our God. Like I say, you know, it's the best deal anybody could ever get is to come and surrender to Jesus Christ. 
true. So, um, he starts with his prayer. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. What about you? You have people you're thankful for? You know, some of us have been walking on this road for a little while. And, uh, you know, in our lives we, you know, we just go forward and never reflect. Never reflect. You know, just move on. That's the nature of the world. How many people have influenced us for positive? Even non-Christians that God has used that we can thank God for. Or even negative circumstances that at the time seem so bitter and so negative that there's no way God could be in it. And, you know, a little further removed down the road, you find out God was working it all to the good. You know, the Bible declares that, uh, what? We receive mercy and compassion, and because we receive it, we're able to pass it on. If I never receive mercy and grace, if I'm really the super saint, then watch out, don't get around me. Because I'll just, I'll just shoot you with Bible verses. You didn't do this. Ah, you didn't do that. Ah, you, you know. Yeah. I usually don't hang around with too many people like that because in one sense they're right, but the other sense they're just using the law to kill me. And uh, I've killed a few people with the law, let me tell you. You know, it doesn't feel good. And it's not full of mercy. It's full of what? Judgment, critical spirit, all that stuff. And God, God, uh, you know, that we'll, we'll get into some things about discernment and other things in here. You've already been through it in the book of Matthew, where Ma uh, Warren Wiersbe took us through and said, do we judge? Yeah, we use discernment. There are certain things that I need to make judgments uh, about, but I do not condemn to hell somebody. I just make judgments for wisdom's sake. And he's gonna, Paul's going to say the same things here in some of the passages, or one of them as we get into this. So he says, uh, thanks. Thanks for them. Now, there was a great reason that he said thanks because of their participation with him. And all that he was going through, right? Um, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with all joy. So, uh, always in every prayer of mine. How many prayers did Paul have for these people? Well, we're going to explore a few passages about where he prayed for other churches. He's going to talk about one of them night and day, right? Again, I don't know what your prayer life is, but there's a motivation here for prayer life because, you see, Satan has bound Paul where? In a prison. Does that stop Paul's ministry? No. Prayer can be more powerful than almost anything else. Praying for someone else that is on the front line is as important as the person that is on the front line. I can't remember the exact number of personnel behind every soldier that went to fight in Normandy, but I believe it was 10 to 1. In other words, for every soldier on the front line, there was 10 people, soldiers, supply, communicators behind them so that they had the things that they had need of that they could fight on the front lines. Spurgeon said it like this. One, one time somebody came to him and said, looking at the key of his success, because he had one of the first big mega churches in England and uh, multiple services. And, you know, somebody said, what's the key of your success? expecting, you know, because I study so often, or do this or do that, and so he took him down to the basement. And down in the basement, through every service, there was 100 to 150 people praying through the service. He said, that's the key to our success. It's called the boiler, boiler room prayer meeting. We don't have a boiler room, folks. Okay? But... <clears throat> 
you get you get the concept and it's going to be kind of pushed home this day for all of us um, uh, so in verse 4 he says I thank my God upon every remembrance always in every prayer of mine making requests for you with joy first of all he had joy which is delight right he delighted to pray for these people the greatest thing that I can do for most of you is keep lifting your name up to the Lord and lifting you up to the throne and I do I do because I believe that that's a key to what really I'm supposed to be doing is lifting you up to the throne so what so God can influence you you know rather than look to myself and go wow you know I'm the great influencer no God's influence is much more important than anything that I can do and anything that I can do can only be used if it's of the persuasion from the Lord to begin with right it's not me it's not me um, in other words, that's, that, that, that's not the way God designed it. We'll, we'll get into that. But he has specific requests and petitions for these people. That's why home fellowships, that's why communicating with one another is important for us. How can I pray for you? Either the Holy Spirit's got to give me discernment, or I can talk to you and find out where your heart is so I can lift you up to the Lord. Because the, the goal is not to judge. The goal is to lift you up so God can what? Move and work. And that's what he prays for, for these people and so many others that he ministered to. I'm going to run through a bunch of verses here so that... We get this locked and loaded in a manner of speaking. I guess I'm in a war mood today. <laughs> okay. Uh, Romans 1, 9 through 10. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Make, making request if by some means now and last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So his petition is that he would be able to go to them and minister to them. You'll have to read the whole of chapter uh, 1 of Romans because he says that I can encourage you and be mutually encouraged by you. That's usually the way that it works. It's not a one-way street. I uh, visited uh, a couple of people that haven't been to church for a while. And I was greatly encouraged by, uh, you know, some of the, the people that I visited. It just totally just blew me away. I went to do my part, but it was a reciprocating, it always is, and it, it always is, it's because we're the body, you know, and so he says, what, without ceasing, he hadn't even been to Rome, and he's praying for the Roman Christians. 1 Corinthians 1, 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. To the Corinthians, the most screwed up church I think you can find in the New Testament. That's why there's so many chapters and there's two books. Okay? They had a lot of things wrong. But he understood they were saved and he was still lifting them up. Right? Uh... Ephesians 1.16 I do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. Making mention of you in my prayers. There are mentioned prayers. I mention you in my prayers. I just put you at the throne, your name at the throne. So if that's all you can do, then do it. Right? Because you're setting somebody at the throne. You're saying God influence their lives. Right? He says, Colossians 1, 3, We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Always? So how many churches is this? One, two, three. This is the fourth church he's praying for. And he had groups of people within that church, right? Well, five if you want to add the Philippians, right? He's praying for all these people. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2. 
We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Once again, mention prayers. You should have a mention list. I mentioned so and so, 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 so. that's okay. You know what? You, you do what works for you. 2 Thessalonians 1 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as is fitting, because your faith grows exceeding and the love for um, of every one of you abounds toward each other. So if he's giving thanks to to God for them, then he's obviously what praying to God because he's communicating with the Lord. Second Timothy one three. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. You get the point. Most of us aren't Paul. But most of us can have just as equal influence on the people around us as he does. There are people I can pray for that aren't even on this continent. And guess what? My expectation is God is going to work. It is amazing how God can work through things like that. My wife, I'll just give you a little example. My wife and I supported... Uh, uh, a man that became a friend, we've lost touch, but he pastors a, a, a Horizon, which is a Calvary Chapel branch in Indianapolis. And uh, he was a missionary smuggling Bibles through Hank Paulson's ministry into Eastern Europe before the Iron Curtain fell down. We knew him as Dave Christopher, Dave Christbear. Okay? Um, I think we supported him with $20 a month, not a super abundant amount of money, but that's what we could afford. That's what we committed to, we kept with it. He would come into San Diego because he was at a, a he got trained at a, a large church in San Diego, Horizon, and the School of uh, Evangelism, and uh, so he would stay at our place before we had kids. We had a trailer home, a double wide, you know, aluminum can if you want to, you know, uh, be a tornado target here, but uh, we didn't have tornadoes in San Diego. But anyways, he would come in, we would put him up, and he was grateful. And we gave 20 bucks. Now I live next to Russians. And I live next to a Russian family. I was at the wedding for one of their sons, uh, Karen and I, just last week. And... Uh, uh, the couple who lived next door, the, the woman's father was a pastor under a communist rule, under Stalin. And I've been to their couple of their church services. I don't really understand a lot of Russian, and uh, yet they invite me to some of the different things that they do. And one of the things that, uh, you know, God reminded me of, he said uh, that there was a connection, a corresponding connection of my love for these people and the $20 that Karen and I gave. There was a corresponding connection that God had made. And it wasn't a great amount of money, that's not the point. But because we prayed for Dave and we were supporting the missionaries that were going into the Eastern Bloc or Dave himself, guess what? Now I get to see some of the people, probably that some of the materials that he smuggled in that they went to these people. Go figure. Had I not given any money, I don't know what would have happened, but I know that God doesn't waste anything that we offer to him. That's my point. And prayer being so much more important, right? So, and then Philemon. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. How many times did he say, I make mention, I make mention, I make mention. There's a prayer list back there for leaders and everything else. I hope you have a prayer list for each other. You, many of you have received emails from me to pray for each other. This is why. This is why. If I don't pray, my heart is not in it. I, it I, you know, there, there, there needs to be a connection because Paul says that about the Philippians. There was a connection. There was a participation. There was a communion. There was a something greater than what? just being in an organization, right? We're a living entity, we're a living body. 
right? And that's that's the the, the point. So um, now, where is Paul? Paul is in prison. He's in chains. But it didn't stop the work of God because the Philippians were still doing the work that was started when him and his three companions showed up because it was a church. How do you get a church out of a jailer and his family and Lydia? Because they shared the gospel. In the midst of what? Persecution, a Roman city. Persecution didn't stop. So they were participants in a lot of ways with Paul. And so they could feel for Paul and they understood, but they were what? They were carrying on the torch that Paul had, what? Planted in that city, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, right? So in verse five, he says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. First day, what first day? I believe he's talking about the Philippian jailer. But he could be talking about Lydia, but I believe he's talking about the Philippian jailer because he was a Macedonian. Lydia was from the other side of the sea. She was a, 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 a Turk or an Asian. So, the Philippian jailer started sharing his faith, right? The jailer, the one who probably treated him spitefully initially, right? Who got saved because of the miracle of what? Them not fleeing. When he was ready to kill himself. He says, no man, you don't do that. Let's, let's, let's get you saved here. And out of that sprang forth a what? A church. An established church with deacons and elders. Isn't that way it started? Right? Or, or bishops and deacons? Well, one family. You never know what God's going to do. But if I don't participate, then do I expect to see anything? Probably shouldn't, should I? Right? I don't know. So, um, Paul writing to them, he says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul is looking at his prison experience in Rome and saying, man, God's doing a greater work. Now all the Roman guard is hearing the gospel. Ultimately, Caesar, Nero, would hear the gospel. Many people would hear the gospel, and Christians are being bold. Who was he praying for that he would visit Rome? He was praying for them long before he ever got there. So some of these people are getting bolder to share the gospel because of what? They're seeing Paul and his courage, right? And that is encouraging them. So he says, your fellowship, that is koinonia, that is participation. I already talked about this. It means to have all things in common, to contribute, partner, sharing. And uh, it can be as simple as a meal or as grand as prayer, communicating through finances, just all the different ways that we would as a family function together or as a family does. It's used four times, two, three direct, one in a, a, a combination of a word, but all meaning the same thing. And that's participation, koinonia. He uses it for this church. They were participants in his life in so many different ways. And again, are we busy bodies? Do I want to get in somebody's life to be? No, that's not the point. But we are a body. We are a family. We need to lift one another up. It's key and important. It's key and important also for where my heart would be. Because if I don't pray for you, then you may end up being a target by me. Target of criticism and critique and, you know, all kinds of different things. So prayer is really a, an important issue for me. And uh, quite often, believe it or not, I'll sit down to pray, start praying. 
and I'll, I'll seemingly waste an hour, but it's not wasted. All of a sudden, I'll just start rambling. The Holy Spirit will kick in, and I'm praying for people. And it may start with this church, the body here, but then it expands all kinds of different areas. And then I'm like, wow, where did time go? Well, it was time well spent because I brought things and issues before the Lord. Quite often, it starts with me, and then once I kick in and get out of the me mode, then, then God does his work, because God's already taken care of me. It's like, get your eyes off of you, but he doesn't tell me that. He just kind of kicks in and says, okay, we're not going to go down this me, myself, and I thing. We're going over here. <laughs> right? Um, so, um, who was Paul? What do we know about Paul? Once again, was he Superman? You know, Captain Fantastic, you know, uh, one of the other Marvel Comics superheroes. No, is a man. Is a man, you know, with like passions just like us. Human needs, emotional, you know, he had tears. His heart was crushed, he's perplexed. Let's run through a few passages and then, yep, we're out of time. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure. Woo, burdened beyond measure. That's heavy burden. Above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Anybody ever felt like you just want to climb up into a fetal position and die? No. Good. No. Don't do it. <laughs> but there's times when you would just, you know, I know for me, I just feel like, man, you know, that song I sang, nobody knows, you know, and I just get crushed. Paul felt crushed. Yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, and we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. Woo! Who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us and whom we trust that he will still deliver us. Here's a kicker. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So he says, here's what I'm going through, but then he adds what? Your prayers are helping me. Your prayers are glory to God, and so that we can all rejoice. He's saying, I can't do this without you. And he's writing to the Corinthians of all churches, right? For God who said, let the light shine out of the darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory and majesty of God, clearly revealed in the face of Christ. But we have this precious treasure, the good news about salvation. This is from the Amplified. In unworthy earthen vessels of human frailty, speaking of himself, right? so that the grandeur and surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God, His sufficiency and not from ourselves. We are pressured in every way, hedged in, but not crushed, perplexed, unsure of finding a way out, but not driven to despair, hunted down and persecuted, but not deserted to stand alone, struck down, but never destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the resurrected resurrection life of Jesus also may be shown in our body. That is the story of this planting of the church in Philippi, is it not? Struck down, perplexed. Why did this happen? Why wasn't it we were just welcomed and everybody got saved? Why did we have to suffer, right? And Satan would attack him. But he understood there was something that was there that was greater. And in the midst of their weakness and rejoicing in what God was doing, being able to perceive beyond the immediate effects, the Philippian jailer gets saved and his whole household. 
And God puts his foot down on the Normandy of Europe and says, we're not going to leave. We're here for an invasion. But the invasion takes on a different look quite often than what we can perceive and think. You see, the world is teaching us that anything negative can't come from God. Conflicts don't come from God, those things. And yet, quite often, it's through what? Unseen circumstances and even conflicts that God is working. Hence the warfare. Right? Now, I'm not saying, you know, um, it's just the way the battle rages. And either I can perceive the battle for what it is, or Satan will always take me down and say, see, God is not good. Was God good to Joseph? So why do, you, why do we so often watch people suffer and we say, well, in a sense, we malign the character of God and say he's not good. Then nothing negative should ever happen to anybody. Then where would our Bibles be? Who, where would somebody get saved? What would ever have happened? Human suffering is a part of what God has brought and allowed and will allow until Jesus Christ comes back to rule and reign. It is the dilemma of human what? Even as Christians, Corey Tinboom, her sister died. The guard that treated her so cruelly came to one of her crusades and there he is up front. And he says, I got saved. And she could forgive him or she could be bitter and say, spit on him or whatever for his cruelty. She chose to forgive him. This is the dilemma, is it not? We live in a world that's fallen and evil, sinful, and yet God is redeeming out of this sinful, fallen world people from what? These things. And he allows his people to suffer for certain reasons to reach others. And that's hard to palate. It's hard to swallow at times unless I get a, what, heavenly perspective. I don't wish any ill upon anybody, but it's usually through conflict that, what, people get saved. It really is. It's usually through conflict and trials in my life that I grow. And yet there's many that just go, well, that shouldn't have happened. <sighs> Tell that to Joseph. Tell that to David. Tell that to Jesus. The greatest good of mankind came where? A man who was crucified. The worst death that could ever, the, the worst designed death instrument that man has ever known. And yet God used that to do what? Bring redemption for each and every one of us. Would I say that Christ didn't need to suffer? Jesus didn't need to suffer? If he didn't suffer, then I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to suffer eternal payment and judgment. But he took it for me, right? So, 2 Corinthians. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience and tribulations and needs and distresses. What did Paul have? In stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and sleeplessness and fastings. By purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by the sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live as chastened yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor and yet made rich, making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Paul could look at both sides of it, right? 
He could say, here's my human experience, but this is what God was doing. Right? Most of us won't have to go through what Paul has gone through. Praise the Lord. But if you do, God will be there. Because he gives power to his people. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things which come upon me daily. My deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble? I do not burn with indignation and I do not burn with indignation. If I must boast, I will boast in the same things which conserve my infirmities, or my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. See the contradiction? It's extreme here. One more time. These are all from 2 Corinthians, by the way. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Many people say, what's the thorn in the flesh? I believe it's explained right here. A messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. A messenger is a person. He had demonic warfare. Satan was allowed to beat on him. For God's purpose... Do you get that? For God's purpose. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me and said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. In the Greek language, that was a choice that he made. He says, when I choose to be weak, then I'm strong. He says, when I choose to be strong, then I'm weak. He understood the principle of God for himself, right? Once again, do I wish this? No, these are extremes. There is no doubt. They are extremes. But in many of these things, many of us can identify. We wonder, am I the only one who goes through these things? Am I the one, the only one that doesn't get any sleep at night because Satan comes and visits me? Am I the only one with stresses and strains and, you know, raising children or whatever the case may be? You're not. Because these are the things that we have to do. And guess what? Paul was an intercessor. His whole life was an intercessory life for others. There's mothers in here. I commend you. Thank God for mothers. There's fathers in here. Thank God for you. There's some of us that are in here that are to pray for mothers and fathers and the children that come to our Sunday school. And the kids that don't have a regular normal family. We are their family. We can intercede. We can make a difference, believe it or not. Because we are the Lord's. We can intercede on behalf of others. If you're in a prison, you can pray. You can write letters. You can do lots of different things. You can get on the phone call. You don't even have to write a letter. You can do a text. You can call somebody. But you see, we quite often approach it and say, well, I don't have anything to offer. Yeah, you do. You're the Lord's. Just as much as this card. I didn't do anything today. 
But thank God for the family that did this. Because it encourages the fathers that are here. And I'm not going to mention who it is because I don't want them to lose their reward. But you know what? What a kind thought. What an encouragement. What a part of the ministry of Calvary Chapel, if you want to have it. The body of Christ. It's important. Even a drink of cold water can be important, can it not? Jesus said, you gave me a drink. I was at a Sam's Club yesterday. It was two guys out painting. One of the guys was on a Navy ship, and I was wearing one of my Navy ship hats. He said, I was on that's and such frigate. And mine had a frigate's name on it. And so we talked briefly, and I walked in, and, you know, they're out there on the front. It's hot. And just laid on my heart to get him something to drink. So I went and bought him a bottle of water, walked back out, and gave it to him. He said, man, we were thirsty. Thank you. I didn't get to share much more than that, but you know what? This guy came down on his man left, took the bottle. The other guy on the man left took the bottle, and I blessed him. Whatever. You know, I wish I could have, you know, got my pulpit out and done a whole sermon, but that wasn't the occasion. 